But I want you to think about a couple of quotes with me for a moment. Um, trying to click. There we go. Thank you. Um, this is from Charles Templeton. He says this in his book, Farewell to God. By the way, Charles Templeton used to work with Billy Graham, used to be a minister, turned into an atheist. And this is what he says. The God of the Old Testament is utterly unlike the God believed in by most practicing Christians. His justice is, by modern standards, outrageous. He is biased, querulous, vindictive, and jealous of his prerogatives. This is one of the reasons listed for why Charles Templeton is no longer a believer. This is something that George Smith wrote in his book, Atheism, The Case Against God. He says, The Old Testament God garnered an impressive list of atrocities. Jehovah himself was fond of directly exterminating large numbers of people, usually through pestilence or famine, and often for rather unusual offenses. And then we have another quote from Richard Dawkins in his book, The God Delusion, which was written in 2006. And this is a quote that you've heard before in another lesson, but it just helps us to see the line of argument that often gets used. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, fanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Well, he's got a good vocabulary. So perhaps you have heard quotes or arguments or questions like the ones that we've just quoted from prominent atheists. The argument really differs from person to person, but its consequences are the same. These types of arguments lead people to unbelief. It might be unbelief in the Old Testament. It might be unbelief in the entirety of scriptures. But the argument is basically that the God of the Old Testament is a cruel, vicious, vindictive God, and I don't want to believe in a God like that. Sometimes people say things like this, though. Even Christians say things like this. They say, you know, the God of the Old Testament seems so full of wrath and vengeful, but the God of the New Testament and Jesus, they're all about love. Now, that might be what some Christians say. That's not what newer atheists say. And the newer atheists in our world are extremely evangelical about their atheism. They say both the God of the Old Testament is hateful, and Jesus even speaks of hell and tells people they'll be condemned. And therefore, because I don't believe any good God would ever talk of hell or would ever condemn someone, then I don't believe in God at all. I don't believe in the Old Testament. I don't believe in the New Testament. I don't believe you should believe in the Old Testament or New Testament. And there's why. Now, in a previous lesson, we've talked about the moral argument and how the very fact that you have a sense of morality is evidence that there is a God. And if there is no God, then where do you get the right to say something is moral or immoral anyway? Because if there is no God, then there's no true standard of right or wrong other than our own opinions and other than just majority rule. But I'm not going to rehash those arguments. All I'm going to say is if you missed that sermon where I talked about the moral argument, then I'd encourage you to listen to it. I've preached it here. I've preached it three other places as well. And so I can send you recordings if you want to hear it. Today, what I want to do is I want to dig into this idea, which sometimes gets assumed that the God of the Old Testament seems so different than the God of the New Testament. I want you to know before we start, this isn't a new idea at all. All the way back in the second century, there was a heretic named Marcion who made these arguments. Marcion was actually expelled from the church in AD 144, but he continued starting up his own churches who followed his own teachings. His writings are not preserved, but we do have the writings of those who dealt with his error and with his false attacks. And so we can reconstruct what he believed from 
those writings. There were early Christians such as Justin Martyr, who lived in AD 100 to 165, who dealt with Marcion's teachings. Irenaeus of Lyons, who lived from AD 130 to 200, dealt with them. And Hippolytus, who lived from AD 170 to AD 235, he combated Marcion um, in defense of the truth. Marcion's belief, though, it was a little different than the atheist belief today. Marcion believed um, that there was a God. He wouldn't say that there was no God. That's not his argument. But he did believe that the God of the Old Testament was a completely different God than the God of the New Testament. So you have two gods there, right? He encouraged Christians not to follow the God of the Old Testament, but just the God of the New Testament, since Jesus was the revelation of the true supreme God. There are major problems with this view. Um, so what we want to do is consider a few factors to help change our thinking when we're convinced to believe skeptical arguments such as these. And so I want to take a look, first of all, at some of the common proof texts that are used to try to prove that God is bad and God is evil, oftentimes from the Old Testament. So we're going to examine some of these proof texts. Now, there's several common proof texts. We can't deal with all of them in one sermon but there's several from the Old Testament that are brought up by skeptics to try and prove that the God of the Old Testament was a terrible, awful, evil God, unworthy of believing and unworthy of following. But what I want to do with you today is I'd like for you to open-mindedly consider and reconsider these proof texts without bias and consider whether or not God was indeed being evil in the passages that are often cited. So we're going to start with the sin of Adam and Eve in Genesis 2 and 3. There are a lot of people who say, well, God was evil because here God created Adam and Eve, and then they break the rule one time, and then they are, uh, they are lost, they are condemned to die. And because some people believe in Calvinistic teaching on this, by the way, they think every single human being has inherited the sin of Adam and Eve. You didn't actually inherit their sin. You're guilty of your sin, but every human being has sinned, um, who's certainly of the age of accountability since Adam and Eve. But some people think that, you know, the, that it's wrong that all of guilty mankind is sentenced to die since the fall of Adam and Eve. And so the argument is, well, how could a good God punish his creation so severely? But I want you to think about this for a minute as we think about the character of God in this text. First of all, you're assuming that God was somehow being unjust or unkind. So I would have a question. Was God unjust or unkind to Adam and Eve? I mean, think about where he put them in the first place. These people were living in paradise. That sounds very kind to me that he created them and he put them in paradise in the first place. But God also, when he put them in paradise, had made his expectations and it has made his boundaries very clear. So there's one rule. You can't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and if you eat of it, you shall surely die. Was, was it unkind for God to be very clear? No, communication is kind. Being clear with people and giving them clarity about, uh, about the consequences of their actions, that's a kindness. Sounds like it's a very just thing to do, just like you would tell your children. If you do that, I'm going to have to discipline you. You made the rules clear, and if they still decide to go on and do it, then that's the choice that they made. It doesn't make you evil because you set boundaries. Um, they made a choice, they knew the rules, and they broke it. So when Adam and Eve violated those boundaries, they were indeed cursed. That's exactly what God had forewarned. Justice is a quality of God. We serve a just God. But as you consider through, um, consider walking through the rest of this story, God was still merciful to Adam and Eve. Uh, if you look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, that's a, a passage that's sometimes called the Proto-Evangelium. It's kind of the, the, the first gospel that you read about in Scripture. And God says, as he speaks to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head. You shall bruise his heel. 
What this passage points ahead to is that one day there was going to be a seed of woman, and we know that as we look at passages like Galatians chapter 3, that, uh, that applies to Jesus. But that seed of woman would reverse the impact that Satan had brought to man and would crush Satan's power and the consequences of Satan's temptation. So as you think about that, you see not the unkindness of God, you see that God was going to give his people a second chance even though they had defied him and broken his will. In fact, if you read through the various examples in the book of Genesis, you find that Adam and Eve, one of the things that God sees is that they're not covered properly, and so he sacrifices animals for the first time we see death to cover their nakedness. And then we start to see in Genesis chapter 4 the importance of the sacrifice and the sacrificial system with, uh, with Abel. We see it again with Noah after he lands the ark in Genesis 8 verse 20. He offers sacrifices in worship to God. We see it with Abraham in Genesis chapter 21 and verse 13. And this system was the very means by which God would one day forgive the sins of all those who were called. This system looked ahead to Jesus by their sacrifices, as well as all those who are in Jesus. And so God, if you look at the context of Genesis, is not being someone who's just hateful and just and just, period, and that's all there is. There's consequences and you die. God, from the very beginning, is planning how he will extend mercy and kindness to his people. He's foreshadowing it through the sacrifices, and it's fulfilled in Jesus. So you think about the reality of this situation today. Adam and Eve break a law. They break a law of God. They knew that they were breaking the law, and they're punished just as God forewarned. But then God tells them that they can one day be freed from their sin through the one who would crush Satan. So the idea is, yes, you are going to die, but the good news is there is hope. You can again live, um, and you can regain access to this paradise. Does that sound like an unjust, harsh judge to you? If the judge had said, hey, I'm going to punish you for a time, but don't worry. I'm working on a way to get you out of the situation, and I'm building you a paradise because I still plan to release you from your crimes. Does that sound like a harsh and vindictive and evil judge to you? A bad judge? It sounds like a judge who's going above and beyond what he has to do to extend mercy to you and kindness, though we don't deserve it. So the problem is not with God. It's that too many are presenting a one-sided view of God. They're not considering the various aspects and attributes of God within the text in the broader context. Let me give you another example that sometimes gets used. It's Noah and the flood. So this text is also used to paint a picture of God. And people say things like, well, I can't believe in a God who would kill entire families and who would commit genocide. You know, when Richard Dawkins says that God is genocidal, that he is infanticidal, when people like Bill Mayer say things like, you know, you believe in a God that kills babies, they're often referring back to this episode in the flood. And they mention the flood. They mention the flood of Noah. It's a common um, speaking point, talking point for skeptics and atheists. So the question often gets asked, well, how could God kill all of the innocent people in the flood? But again, what, what is often happening is we're being emotionally convinced to believe that God is being terrible. The question in itself suggests a prejudice. So we're being emotionally convinced to believe that God is being terrible and malicious here without taking into account the entire picture. And we only usually get one snippet in the attack of the picture but I want you to look at the big picture in the rebuttal. For example, we need to not forget that Genesis 6 does speak of the grace of God extended to Noah. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8 says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And he may very well not have deserved that grace. Nobody deserves the grace of God. But Noah finds grace. Nobody wants to emphasize that. God didn't have to save anybody, but he did save Noah. But please take into account 
also that this generation was not innocent. When people say things like, how could God kill all the innocent people? These people weren't innocent. God never says that they were innocent. I'm just going to kill them anyways. These people were extremely guilty of sin. Genesis 6, 5 says that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That described the generation. These are people who couldn't stop thinking about murder. They couldn't stop thinking about rape. They couldn't stop thinking about sexual acts and, and molestation and things that are just some of the most despicable things that you could imagine. They were always thinking of the wrong things. So we are painting and we are being led to believe that this is a prettier picture of these people when God knew the truth about them. We need to trust that God knows the truth better than we do. These were murderers, rapists, thieves, child murderers, cannibals, liars. Now, please also don't think that God just said, hey, I'm done with you. The flood's coming tonight. We're finished. Because you don't really understand the big picture of what happened here. God gave man 120 years to repent. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3, the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. That's pretty merciful. It's pretty kind. That's pretty patient to give somebody, I'm going to give you 120 years to make this right. We sometimes won't give people one day. God says, I'll give you 120 years to fix your life. And so, uh, that's long-suffering. That's patient. 1 Peter 3.20 talks about the patience and the long-suffering of God. But, but even though God was patient and long-suffering, no one got in the ark except those eight souls. Had the opportunity to repent, to respond. The Bible even says that, that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He was preaching every time he swung the hammer, every time he laid another board, every time that ship got built bigger and bigger. No one was listening. Finally, though, if all these families had 120 years to repent and the lives of entire households were at stake, and yet these families still ignored the warning, then who is to blame? Who is really to blame? Is it God who sounded the warning through Noah? Or is it the parents of these children who ignored God's warning calls and chose to continue in their evil ways. We need to put the blame where it belongs. And we're letting the skeptics put the blame on God. The blame needs to be put on the people who were evil and never repented, though they had 120 years to do so. Let me give you a third example that sometimes gets noted in Scripture. It's Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, <clears throat> Another example that's often cited is how the Lord rained fire. You read it in Genesis 19:24. The Lord rained fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah, and he completely destroyed those cities. But again, if you quote that text, and you don't think about the context of what was happening here, you're being really unfair with how you are displaying the character of God in this text. Go back to Genesis 18, and when you go back to Genesis 18, what you find is that Abraham finds out that the city is going to be destroyed. God forewarns Abraham. And when Abraham finds out that the city is going to be destroyed, then Abraham asks a series of questions to God. It's really one of the first examples of intercessory prayer in your Old Testament, where he says, God, will you destroy the city if there's 50 righteous people here? God says, no, I won't destroy it. Will you destroy the city if there's 40 righteous people here? No, I won't destroy it. What about 30? What about 20? What about 10? God can't even find 10 righteous people in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Every time Abraham asked that question, God says, I won't destroy it if you can find that many righteous people. But unfortunately, the only people that could be found were Lot and his family. Now, even though there's less than 10 righteous people in these cities, ask another question. Did God punish those righteous people? No, he didn't. He shows mercy to Lot and his family. There is mercy in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah because God shows mercy to them. He allows them the opportunity to escape. Genesis 19 and verse 29 says this. 
that it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham. Sodom and Gomorrah is an example of God answering Abraham's prayer and his request on behalf of the righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. And it says that he sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. So what we have here is a city that is called exceedingly wicked in Genesis 18 and verse 20, where there were even homosexual rapists who sought to attack city guests and kidnap them for their sex trade. It's amazing who people will stand against sex trafficking, but then they'll use Sodom and Gomorrah as if God did something evil here. This is the ancient example of homosexual sex trafficking in Genesis 19. A just and righteous God can't tolerate that, doesn't tolerate that. It is blatant sin, but still God is showing mercy to the one family who was not involved in it. So when I read this text, I don't use this text to attack the character of God because I think this text is intended to highlight his justice toward evil and his mercy towards the righteous. This text is a reason to praise God, not to condemn him, because God, even though you might live in a horrible, sinful world, you might be one of the only few people who are trying to do us right, God knows those who are his. And this text teaches us that. Let me give you another example that sometimes gets used. The Egyptians. The Egyptians. In Exodus 5 through 15. Now, we're not going to read all 10 chapters, but we're going to quickly summarize. Some people go back to Moses and Aaron when they led Israel out of Egypt. And there are some people who say, well, it was wicked for God to kill the firstborn of the Egyptians and to drown an entire army in the Red Sea. People say that was evil of God. That was wrong of God. How could, if God is good, why would he have killed the firstborn in every family of the Egyptians? You all right? You need somebody to do the Heimlich or something? Now, <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> if you think about the Exodus out of Egypt, once you think about the broader text here. And I want you to think of a few things before we start maligning God's character. Okay, first of all, God is rescuing Israel. Think about what's happening in the Exodus out of Egypt. God is rescuing Israel from an Egyptian nation who has enacted brutal practices towards the Israelite slaves. Do you remember why God was releasing Israel? Because they were slaves and they were being abused as slaves, making them make bricks without straw. The taskmasters were being extremely hard on them. They were whipping them. They were treating them cruelly. So God was actually trying to release people who were being oppressed. But the Egyptians were also mandating the death of Hebrew children. Remember that? That's why Moses was hidden in a basket because his mom wasn't willing to put her son to death. And she floated him down the river. And it happened to be that a relative of Pharaoh finds him and he's raised up in Pharaoh's household because of it. They did that because these children were being murdered. These, they, the Hebrews were getting too numerous. Now, who is it, first of all, when it comes to the nations here, that's truly evil? The Egyptians were extremely evil. They were brutal. They were abusive slave owners. They were baby killers. And God was trying to protect Israel from it. So before we start to malign the character of God, think about what was going on in the bigger picture here. Secondly, remember this. God gave Pharaoh several warning plagues. 
There's 10 plagues. The 10th, the very last one, is the death of the firstborn. He gave, them, he gave him nine opportunities before he ever got to the 10th to repent and to relent to God's will. But his prideful heart was hard and it was obstinate and he would not. Now, let's also remember that there was a way that the death of the firstborn could be avoided. And that way was that you put blood on the doorpost. But unbelieving Pharaoh would, would never have chosen to honor God's means of mercy, and he did not. So ultimately, when God calls Pharaoh and Egypt to repent and they refuse to do so, who is truly to blame here? Again, God gave them opportunity. He extended mercy, but they chose not to receive it. God is acting out of justice then on behalf of his people. He's extending mercy that is being refused. His character is not to be maligned here. And when people attack the character of God from episodes like these, perhaps they need to see the full story. We need to think about the bigger picture. So many Bible attacks can be disposed of if we'll just study and think about context. There's another example that we might use and that can get used, and that's the wilderness wonders, wanderers just simply have Numbers 13 and 14. There's certainly a much bigger text that talks about the wandering in the wilderness. But there are some who think, well, God was being harsh and brutal by making the wilderness wanderers of Israel die out in the wilderness before allowing his people to enter the promised land. Why would God do that? Why would God just put people, lead them out of Egypt, cross the Red Sea, put them out into the wilderness, and then have them die there? Just because they complained? He's going to put them out there? And if you read the book of Numbers, for example, what you're going to come across when you read Numbers is you're going to come across a generation of Israelites who were largely disobedient. They were rebellious and they were sinful. And as a result, you find God often having to punish the disobedient. Numbers is an interesting book, but it's definitely not a record of Israel's best moments. It's a lot of bad moments in the book of Numbers. Israel was at their worst here, murmuring, complaining, usurping the authority of their leaders, trying to create division, uh, creating false worship. Instead of thinking of God in the worst light, though, I think we need to consider some other things if we look at the bigger picture. First of all, put the blame where it belongs. That's on the complaining, entitled wilderness wanderers. I mean, even God exhaustively says this in Numbers 14, 11. He says, how long will this people reject me? How long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them? It's like God is saying, can't they see how good I've been to them? I put them out of their Egyptian bondage. I crossed the Red Sea. They're eating manna and quail and drinking water that came from a rock. I mean, I keep helping them and they keep complaining. At what point are they going to wake up? God had done more than enough to prove himself, and still they're disrespecting his authority. Later in Numbers 14, we read of how God had been very patient through the acts of disrespect. You look at Numbers 14, verse 23. It says, All these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have put me to the test now these ten times. Your kids break a rule that you've created. Ten times? Don't you get kind of sick and tired of it? And that's where God is in this text. They have put me to the test ten times, and if not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. But again, when you look at the text, God doesn't just blanket condemn Israel either. God is just. But he also knows the righteous from the unrighteous. And when you read Numbers 14, 24, he goes on to say, My servant Caleb, remember one of the two spies who gave a good report of the land and he said, let's do it. Let's have faith in God. He remembers Caleb. And he says, My servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him, because he has followed me fully, I will bring him into the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. In these texts, what we see is a God who has been patient, through the disobedience, but at some point, the patience and mercy runs out and justice is served. But because he is just, he does not punish faithful Joshua and Caleb along with the unfaithful, nor does he punish, by the way, the children. He allows them to live. They weren't the ones complaining, it was their parents. So be careful of being so laser-focused on God's justice and judgments that we fail to see the mercy of God 
in these passages. Well, let me give you one more, and that'd just be the Canaanites in general. His argument gets used a lot. One final Old Testament example would be how God required the utter destruction of the Canaanite nation. Sometimes people go to 1 Samuel 15 and they say, well, God wanted to utterly destroy all of the Amalekites, men, women, children, everyone. Sometimes people talk about when Joshua entered the promised land, he was supposed to drive out all of the Canaanites and they were to destroy them so that they could move into the promised land. And people say that's, that's wrong. It's wrong for God to expect that. It's wrong for God to do that. That's harsh. That's brutal. So they argue, why would God require his holy nation to completely destroy entire families of Canaanites just for a land grab? And they make it sound so simple and easy like that. This is just God being greedy, just wanting his nation to have the best land, and just kicking anybody out who's in there. Man, you, you have really asked an extremely biased question when you ask that question that way. But that's how we persuade people sometimes, especially if people aren't willing to study the text. There's a lot more to the story than just randomly destroying these seven nations. First of all, it was, yes, the job of Israel to drive out the nations within the promised land. As Joshua mentions in Joshua 3 and verse 11, this included the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. There were seven nations and we oftentimes just call them Canaanite nations, but these were all seven different nations that were in Canaan's land that was to be moved out. Now, if you don't know the scriptures, then you think to yourself, well, why would God just kick out these good and innocent people out of their land? And if you think that, you're making an assumption, first of all. You're assuming that they're good. These were not good and innocent people at all. Even in the days of Abraham, the Amorites were evil, and God was not ready yet to bring judgment upon them. In Genesis 15 and verse 16, Genesis, uh, in the book of Genesis, God tells Abram, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. God's already tired of the sins of the Amorites, but he says, I'm not going to bring judgment on them yet. That's going to happen when they start to enter the promised land. They were iniquitous then, but they were going to get worse. But by the time we get to Joshua, their iniquity was ready to be punished. In fact, one of the reasons that God allows his nation to drive out the Canaanite nations is because they were extremely wicked. If the nation of Israel was to move in alongside them, it would corrupt the nation that God wanted to be separate and holy. Now, if you don't believe me, I really want you to turn to Leviticus chapter 18, and I want you to take a look at verse 2. Because you maybe have read quotes from Leviticus 18, and a lot of times if people want to talk about why they think homosexuality is wrong, sometimes they'll go to Leviticus 18. I would encourage you to go to New Testament passages, not just Old Testament passages, but indeed it's mentioned in Leviticus chapter 18. But I want you to see who it was that was practicing these practices. And you see that in verse 2 and 3. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. Look at verse 3. According to the doings of the land of Egypt, they were sinful people with sinful practices as well, where you dwelt, you shall not do. And according to the doings of the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you, you shall not do nor shall you walk in their ordinances. Now, we don't have time to read the entire chapter of Leviticus chapter 18, but if you've read it, what you will find is the sins of the Egyptians and the Canaanites that they're not supposed to be doing that are listed in the chapter are that they were committing incestuous acts, they were committing sexual acts with their mothers, with their sisters, with their relatives, they were sacrificing their children to Molech, murdering their own children. They were condoning homosexual acts. They were having sex with animals. Look at verse 23. That's where you'll see that. These were the sins of the Canaanites. This is why God wanted them driven out. This is why God wanted them destroyed. Furthermore, God was extremely patient before he ever drove them out. 
Geisler points this out in Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Faith. He has a good chapter on this very topic that we're talking about here today, plus a little bit more. But he says this, if you take all the Canaanites along with the Amalekites, they had 400 years to repent. That's a very long time. After waiting centuries to give them an opportunity to abandon their path towards self-destruction, God's nature demanded that he deal with their willful evil. He certainly didn't act precipitously. Those who had wanted to get out of the situation had already done so and had ample opportunity through the years. I mean, have you thought of passages like Joshua chapter 2, where God shows mercy to a believing prostitute named Rahab? She's from these nations. But she believes in the God of Israel, and God shows her mercy mercy. Again, what do we find? In every one of these examples, God punishes the evil because he is just, but he shows mercy to the God-fearing in the text. In the big, bigger picture, we see the balance of justice and mercy. So maybe the problem is not that God is so evil, but that we've been led to believe that without fully considering the accusation. In nearly every case, we've noted that God is enacting justice. He's enforcing a just punishment and discipline. That doesn't make God evil. Punishing evil is God's means of purification of both individuals and nations. It doesn't make him evil any more than it makes us evil if we discipline our own children. And that's not just a personal opinion. That's an argument of Scripture. Hebrews chapter 12 says that who the Lord loves, he chastens. And he says that you as parents, if you love your children, you will also chasten them and discipline them. Discipline and punishment come from a heart of love. So don't buy into the idea that God's punishments are attributes of evil and hatred. It's an attribute of his holiness. This chart, I think, is kind of interesting here. It maybe summarizes what we just talked about. Adam and Eve, were they sinning? Yes. Was God just to punish them? Yes. But did God save and extend mercy? Well, yes, he did. Genesis 3.15, he looked ahead to the day of redemption. In the flood, were they sinning? Yes. Was God just to punish them because they were thoughts of their heart were ex exceedingly evil and wicked continually? Yes. But did God save and extend mercy? Yes. Gave him 120 years and he saved the eight people who came to him. Sodom and Gomorrah, were they sinning? Yes. Was God just to punish them? Yes. But did God save and extend mercy? Yes. He saw Lot's family and he saved Lot's family who was willing to follow his will. The Egyptians, were they sinning? Yes. Brutal slave owners and baby killers. Was God just to punish them? Yes. But did God save and extend mercy to them? Yes. Yeah. They could have relented. They could have repented. They could have put the blood on the doorpost. They didn't. The wilderness wanderers, were they sinning? Yes, they were. Was God just to punish them? Yes, they were. But did God save and extend mercy? Yes, because they didn't have all of the children killed who weren't guilty of the same sins of their parents. And he also saved Joshua and Caleb and granted them access to the promised land. The Canaanites, same story. So, what do we need to know about God? Well, I want you to know, first of all, we see the mercy and the love and the grace of God, even in the Old Testament. Don't let people lead you to believe, don't believe that God is just all wrath and he's all vengeance and he's all jealousy and there's no mercy. There's mercy in your Old Testament. And there's mercy because God's character is unchanging. He didn't just suddenly become merciful when you hit the New Testament. God's character has always been a character of mercy. Malachi 3 and verse 6, it says, I, the Lord, do not change. And therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. God's character is unchanging. James 1.17, if you want a New Testament passage, says the same thing, that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. God is consistently good. God is consistently good. His character does not change. The Old Testament does not declare God is only wrath either. That's a, mis, that's a misnomer. For example, we could look at some of these proof texts. We've already seen it, I think, in, even in some of the most attacked proof texts. 
But if you just read some of these verses, what you see are things like this. Exodus 34 and verse 6, The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. But he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. A lot of positive attributes of God listed in that passage. Every attribute of God is positive, but certainly the ones that we think we only find in the New Testament, we find them in the Old Testament. Numbers 14, 18 says, The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty. Deuteronomy 4, 31, The Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. Nehemiah 9, verse 17, they refused to obey. They were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them. This is Nehemiah praying in chapter 9. They stiffened their neck. They appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And you did not forsake them. We could quote Psalms all day long. Psalm 86, verse 5. You, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. You, O Lord, verse 15, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. So the Old Testament is not all about a God of just wrath. But the New Testament is also not a text that's just all about love. The New Testament talks of God's justice. The New Testament talks of God's wrath. Even Jesus in the New Testament warns of God's wrath and punishment. If you think God's wrath isn't present in the New Testament, then you're ignoring one of the lines from John the Baptizer, the one who paved the way to Jesus. One of the things he says in Luke 3 and verse 7, he says, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. The one who prepares the way for Jesus, he speaks of God's wrath. And do you know what new character, New Testament character said this one? It's from Matthew 23, 32 and 33. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? That was Jesus. Jesus said that. Jesus said this too in the parable of the sheep and goats in Matthew 25. He will say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. These will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. You see, if we're preaching a Jesus who is only grace, without punishment, then we are preaching a lopsided Jesus. And maybe that's the problem. We're only preaching the attributes of Jesus that we know people want to hear and not preaching an accurate description of who Jesus really is. Romans 1 and verse 18, Paul says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. The gospel of grace is boldly preached because we recognize the wrath of Almighty God. You don't have the need for grace if you don't understand the reality of his wrath. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 5, Paul again says, This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering, since indeed God considers it just. Verse 6, 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 6, Since God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you you. Who's going to be repaid with affliction? Look at verse 8. In flaming fire, God is going to inflict vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Don't think the New Testament is just all about grace and love. It is also about the attributes of God that we see in the Old Testament, and they are carried over into the New Testament as well. Why do we see that from people like Jesus and the apostles of Jesus? Well, we would expect to see it from Jesus because Jesus is God. Why don't we? 
Jesus was, is, always will be God. The Jesus of the New Testament is not a different deity than we find in the Old Testament. What we are told from the very first verses of the Gospel of John is in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. John 1 and verse 18, the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. And so, um, in Jesus, uh, we see reflected the character of God, for he is God. We see his justice. We see his anger. We see him flipping over tables in the temple because he's upset with the money changers. We see him calling out those self-righteous Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23, but man, we also see his mercy and his compassion and his patience and his love, just like we see those things in the Old Testament too. But we see the fuller, bigger picture of how God will extend those things to us through Jesus Christ. God's means of salvation, that's the lesson for you today, but I'll conclude with this idea. God's means of salvation in every testament has been by grace through faith. Don't think that, that grace didn't exist in the Old Testament. It did exist. These men who lived without faith, they were lost. Those men who lived in rebellion to God's will, they are lost. But those men who put their faith in God and trusted in Him were counted righteous, whether that be Noah. God extended His grace to Noah, and by Noah's faith, then Noah was blessed. Whether that be Abraham, God extended his grace to Abraham, and because of Abraham's faith, it was counted to him as righteousness. Whether that be David, God extends his grace to David, and even though David failed God from time to time and did wrong, he was brought back into right relationship with God by his penitence and his repentance, and he found grace from God through his faith. Whether it be a thief on a cross, whether it be a Jew or a Gentile, God's grace is extended and only those who partake of his extended hand of mercy will be saved. And the same is true today. Noah had to enter the grace of God through the ark. The, the, the Israelite people had to receive the grace of God by painting blood on their doorposts and they had to be within that house. And if you want the grace of God, well, what we're told in the New Testament is that you have to do it through the ark of safety, the household of faith that God has blessed us with when we are in Jesus Christ. He is the door. He is the way. He is the truth, and He is the life, and no one comes to the Father but through Him. And even though we have been sinful, and even though we have wronged Him, He still extends His grace and His mercy and His forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ who died for our sins.